Let's take our Bibles and look together in Psalm 110 once again. Last week we looked at the first three verses, and now the Lord willing will finish up this psalm today from verse 4 down to verse 7. Not a very long song, but a very powerful psalm, very deep, much here to consider. And the title of today's message is is God's King Priest. We saw last time how the psalmist represented the Lord Jesus Christ in his kingly role, that from verse 1, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And we saw how that was ultimately fulfilled in the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ after he had come and finished the work that the Father sent him to do. I love preaching a finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love preaching the successful Savior because that's who he is. He's not a wannabe king or a wannabe Savior. He saves Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Were he not the king, then how could he save? And then, indeed, it would be as so many preach him, sadly, that he's done all this work, but now it's up to man to make it effectual. I can't imagine what kind of savior that would be. No, he's the successful Savior, and he's the one that God the Father has established as his king. We saw that in Psalm 2. I have set my king on my holy hill, the Father said. So Christ isn't up for election. We don't go out and preach him and hope that people will believe on him to make him king. No, he is king already, and we see the fulfillment of that here in Psalm 110 and verse one and then verse two it speaks of his work that we saw the lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of zion rule thou in the midst of thine enemies that's where all of this was fulfilled on that mount zion that's where god purposed in the old testament that the city of jerusalem should be built and that the temple be established and that temple representing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the temple and uh, he's the priest. He's the sacrifice. He's the altar. All that pertain to that Old Testament temple pertain to Christ. And so it's out of Zion that the Lord, you see capital L-O-R-D, and there here we see the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Spirit. It was out of Zion that that rod of strength was sent. A rod represents authority. And so everything that he came to accomplish, he did. And out of Zion is ruling in the midst of his enemies. We're all enemies by nature. But from that work that he came and accomplished by grace, he is causing those who are by nature enemies. And yet those the father gave him, he's causing them to bow. And the rest, he will judge. So we see his role there as the king. And then in verse 3, we looked at that. When it says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. And we noted that that word power is really a word which means the mustering of his armies. The mustering of his people. I know so often verse 3 is read as pertaining to the individual work in the hearts of his elect by the Spirit of God, that in that day then the Spirit works and draws each one to Christ. And while that is true, yet here in the context, thy people, who's that? That's those the Father has given to his Son, shall be willing, they will be willing followers after Christ. 
in the day of thy power, in the day that he musters his armies. That's representing his church. And in the beauties of holiness, that's speaking of how these are dressed. It's not in uniforms of warfare as you see in the world, but those that Christ has redeemed, this is speaking here of the entire body of redeemed ones dressed in the holiness or the righteousness of Christ that he came and earned and established on their behalf and imputed to their account. And when it says there from the womb of the morning, it's forward looking to that time when Christ would come and did come. It's like a dawning of a new day. That's how it's represented there in Luke chapter one. And then it says, thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now I've got fact checkers. And the last time I mentioned dew coming from heaven and uh, someone wrote and said that actually dew forms on the ground. So I stand corrected. But nonetheless, the whole idea there is of the freshness of the morning and what the Lord had purposed that Christ should accomplish in coming to this earth, that this would be through his work, the gathering, the mustering of this entire body of people in the day that he does it. You see, the day there, I believe, has to do with when Christ had finished the work, all those for whom he paid the debt were redeemed and justified. So that's a review of what we looked at the last time. Now, verse 4 down to verse 7 is where we're going to focus and see now God's king priest. The first part, we see him as the king coming to accomplish the work of his father. And here we see him as that king priest where it says, the Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen he shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. So there's a lot here for us to understand by way of context, beginning with verse 4. When it says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever. So in the context, we've been seeing how this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ and continues down through here. But who is Christ? Yes, he's the everlasting king that the father has established and set upon his throne. But he is also the everlasting high priest. Here is a high priest in contrast to the temporary priesthood that God initially set up. That was to be for a time only. It was a type of picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand when you go to build a building, there's a blueprint. And the Old Testament is the blueprint. That's what the priesthood represented. It was a foreshadowing of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ when he would come. So the Lord never swore or established that that Old Testament priesthood should be forever. But there is an everlasting priesthood. There is an everlasting high priest that God the Father has sworn should be established forever. And you notice here, it's not after the order of Aaron. The Old Testament priesthood was after the order of Aaron and his sons. But that went away. In fact, it went away when the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. And it was by his sacrifice that God the Father now was pleased, reconciled, propitiated, 
and therefore no more need for that Aaronic priesthood. But the Jews were hardened enough that even though on that day the veil was rent from top to bottom in the temple and there was an earthquake and the body bodies of Old Testament saints came forth and walked around Jerusalem there was a lot taking place that day but the Jews went back and sewed up that veil and continued on with their worship until God destroyed the city and the temple in 70 AD they were determined to maintain that Old Testament priesthood when in reality God purposed that it should only be up until what the writer of the Hebrews calls there in Hebrews 6 the time of the Reformation when Christ came and fulfilled it all but here when it says the Lord has sworn and will not repent the word there means relent that means that God has always purposed that his son should be this everlasting priest and never deviated from that down from the beginning of creation all the way through up till when Christ came everything was directed toward his being established as God's everlasting high priest so this puts the statement that follows in a very solemn and strong context when it says the Lord capital L-O-R-D here specifically it would be with reference to God the Father making this oath it's one thing when men make oaths and then they don't fulfill them but here when it's describing God himself making this oath that would never be annulled that gives us some confidence today as we read the scriptures is Christ that one that we are to rest in and look to as the mediator between God and sinners such as we are and the clear answer throughout all of scripture here we're reading this in the Old Testament but it is an absolute yes never look anywhere else don't try to come in any other way here we have God not that it was even necessary but when it says has sworn this is like a swearing in in a court case raise your hand and, and tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help me God well here's God as it were pledging by his own name and think about it with the fullness of his unchanging power and will to fulfill this word that he had promised it's irrevocable and it is an omnipotent all-powerful decree nothing could undo it thankfully not even our sin could undo this this high priest when you think about high priest being established it's because we're sinners and I know sometimes we get wondering well I wonder if this sin is not too much for God to forgive if the Lord Jesus Christ paid the debt and he was established as that high priest for his people there is no sin that could ever keep God from saving that one that he's purposed to save because he's established Christ as that high priest forever and that's what we read here you are thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek so this is the word of God himself do we trust him yes he's trustworthy do we trust his word absolutely it's written for our encouragement and comfort those of us that are the Lord's but with regard to this one who was to be the king priest that is God the son he vowed that the Lord Jesus Christ would be established with an everlasting priesthood and that's why here it was not after the order of Aaron had it said after the order of Aaron we would have concern because Aaron is no more but here it says that it would be after the order or pattern of Melchizedek and it's interesting that Melchizedek is only mentioned in one single account in the Old Testament 
And yet that was sufficient for us now because throughout scripture we find him mentioned over and over again. If you look back with me in Genesis chapter 14, who was Melchizedek and why is he used as that pattern by which the Lord Jesus Christ would be established as God's high priest forever? What are the things about Melchizedek that we can find as types and pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ? In Genesis 14, in verses 18 to 20, and in this context here, it's a brief account, but it's packed with truth concerning Melchizedek. If we had time to read from verse 1, we'd see that Abraham had defeated an entire confederation of kings that had taken his nephew Lot captive. And so on his return, Abraham met this mysterious priest named Melchizedek. You can see that in verse 18. It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and it says he was the priest of the Most High. Well, Melchizedek, the name itself means king of righteousness. And when it says that he reigned over Salem, the city of Salem, that would have been an ancient name actually for the city of Jerusalem. And it means peace. So put those two together in this name, Melchizedek, king of Salem. You can see how it represents the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as king of righteousness. That's why Christ came into this world to establish that righteousness that God the Father required in order to save his people. But at the same time, king of peace. What's the result of Christ having earned and established that righteousness? Well, we know that it means that at the cross, God once for all imputed, put to the account of that army that we saw in verse 3 of people gathered, the very righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thereby peace has been established. God is reconciled. I wasn't even there. And yes, as I'm born in this world, I'm born in my heart in rebellion against God until such time as the Spirit is pleased to draw me to Christ, but my reconciliation took place there at the cross. My propitiation was in the death of Christ. That's how he's the king of righteousness and the king of peace. So Melchizedek here is described not only as this king of righteousness, the king of peace, but also, you see there in verse 18, he was the priest, not just a priest, he was the priest of the Most High God. I don't have any problem in my mind in seeing that this one Melchizedek likely was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ because we don't find any other mention in Scripture that he, there was ever a Melchizedek that literally reigned at this time. When you go back, and that's why I call it the mysterious appearing, there are different times in the Old Testament when there were appearances unto God's people and it was a pre-incarnate, in other words, before Christ actually came in the flesh, appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ to his people. And I believe we may well have that case here. So Melchizedek was not merely a worshiper of the true God, here we see in verse 18 that he had that honored title of not just a priest, but the priest of the Most High God. This was done even before the priesthood had been established. That was to come later. And yet he's called here the priest of the Most High God. And that's why we find in verse 19 him blessing Abraham. Who can truly bless one of the Lords unless it be 
the Lord himself. Melchizedek blessed Abraham, which demonstrated here then his greatness even over Abraham and all of the patriarchs. And that's where we read as you go on, Abraham recognized, it says in verse 19, he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of the most high God. So he was the priest of the most high God and yet he's addressing Abraham or in this case right now, Abram, which means father when, it, when he was later named Abraham. That means the father of many. But here, blessed be Abraham, it says, father of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Well, how was he the father of the most high God? The Lord would indicate to Abraham that through his seed, there would be all the families of the earth be blessed. In other words, all of the elect that God had purposed to say from every tribe, nation, and tongue would come through Abram. At this particular time, he didn't even have a seed yet. So that's an amazing statement right there. And it was Melchizedek that blessed him. Well, Abraham knew then that he was dealing with one that wasn't a mere man. And we know that of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not a mere man. He was the God-man. And that's why in verse 20, Abraham, or Abram here, blessed, said, And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. That also is interesting because the tithe had not yet been established. But when it says he gave him tithes, the tithe under the Old Testament economy was to be given to the priests, the lineage of Aaron, in order that they would live on while they were ministering at the priesthood. They were not to have any land of their own, houses of their own. Their entire lives were dedicated to the ministry there in the tabernacle in the temple. And a tithe is the tenth part. So here, when it says Abraham gave him tithes of all, that would refer to the spoils of the battle that he gave. Why did he give him a tithe of all? Well, he saw in Melchizedek then a representation of him as the priest and a foreshadowing of the giving of those tithes that were required under the law that should continue until such time as Christ should come. But why in all of this, we see representations of Christ, but why in all of this particularly is it a type of the Lord Jesus Christ? And why was the Lord Jesus Christ then to be established forever according to the order of Melchizedek? It's interesting that in scripture there is no mention at all of any father or mother of Melchizedek, no beginning. And so he appears to be without genealogy. This also represents then our Lord Jesus Christ who is from before time as God's son and is forever without beginning or without end. When he was born in this world we can say that Mary's womb was borrowed as the means for him to be brought into this world, but that wasn't his beginning. The scriptures say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He has been forever, and he is forever. That's why he is the I Am. As the Lord told those Pharisees before Abraham was, he didn't say I was, he said I am. And that's why they took up stones to stone him. So coming back here to my text in Psalm 110, we can see then why it says here in this prophetic word in verse 4 that he would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. With this oath, God revealed that there was to be another order or priesthood apart from that priestly order of Aaron. All of those 
Israelite priests were descended from Aaron and served in the tabernacle, later the temple. And that's what they did. They offered sacrifices and they conducted ceremonies according to God's law. But here we see that God had already, even with that going on, God had already purposed that there should be another priestly order after the pattern of Melchizedek. Now here's where we get confirmation even in the New Testament because I've been telling you this pertains to Christ but there's confirmation in the scripture when he says you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek this oath even though there's only one mention of Melchizedek as we saw in Genesis 14 yet this oath was so vital and important that the writer to the Hebrews refers to it five times. If you look with me over in Hebrews chapter 5, and this is where I love comparing Scripture with Scripture. Scripture is its own best interpreter, its own best commentary. People like to run the men's commentaries to try to figure out, but just use a cross-reference Bible. You don't need one with men's notes in it. These so-called study Bibles are a perversion, I believe, because it's taking men's words and putting it right in with the Word of God, and that's where people get messed up. Just get you a, a good Bible, King James Version, with cross-references, and you'll see this cross-reference over here to Hebrews 5 to begin with. And the writer begins there in verse 1, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So it's describing that old priesthood. But when you get over to verse 6, well, we can start in verse 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten you, that's talking about his coming into this world as God's representative high priest. But verse 6, as he saith also in another place, and I told you that really chapters and verses were not put in to the scriptures until the 1500s. And I'm thankful that they put them in, although they're not inspired. There's sometimes where the divisions fall in places where probably shouldn't be but at least we can say we'll turn back to Genesis 14 verses 18 to 20 here the writer simply says he saith also in another place so that would mean someone would have to go back and get a scroll out and find that place but what he says is exactly what we just read thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek and how does the writer to the Hebrews tie that in with Melchizedek? Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him or death, he was heard in that he feared. Though he were son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, perfected. In other words, he had to earn and establish this righteousness in order to be called the king of righteousness and the king of Salem, the king of peace, being per made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So that's one reference that we find here in the writer of the Hebrews. I said there were five. Look over in verse 10. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And he says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered seeing ye are dull of hearing. That's describing all of us. If we didn't have the Spirit of God teaching us, how could we even plummet the depths of what we're reading here? And then over in chapter 6 and verse 20, he says it again, whither the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, and again, made in high praise forever after the order of Melchizedek those three references and then you get over to chapter 7 because it begins again in verse 1 for this Melchizedek king of Salem priest of the most high God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him 
to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness and after also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Here it is, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abide a priest continually. That's the commentary and what we're reading here. But you get down to verse 17, again he says, For he testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then the final reference down in verse 21. Sounds redundant, doesn't it? But there's a reason that we understand why God swore that that Melchizedek would be a type and picture of his son. It says for verse 21, for those priests were made with, without an oath. That's talking about the priests in the Old Testament. They, they were born into that lineage as sons of Aaron. It didn't require an oath. But since this was after another order, then it required God's testimony himself. And that's why it says, for those priests were made without an oath, but, the, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 22, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. What a beautiful portion of scripture then. But all of these scriptures emphasize that this was God's declaration. That's why we trust it and believe it. It's not something that even the Lord Jesus claimed for himself. That's where the Pharisees were always trying to deny him or accuse him that it was just his own testimony. But even as Christ said, let every word be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. We certainly have more than two or three witnesses. We have the witness here of God the Father concerning his son. We have the witness of the spirit through his word that this is so. And then we have the testimony of all of God's prophets and writers there in the scriptures. So we see why this is emphasized. Also, it serves to show us that this very high priest that God established. He came and fulfilled what was required of, of him and now is alive. When it says high priest forever, it means forever. He ever lives to intercede on behalf of those for whom he paid the debt. And so even now, ruling and reigning in glory, assuring that everyone for whom he paid the debt will be brought unto him but what a I, lo I love even that word order coming back to Psalm 110 and verse 4 after the order of Melchizedek don't you know that God is a God of order and I'm thankful that it's so that's what David said in his last words he thanked God that that everlasting covenant was ordered in all things and sure this is not something that man devises but it's what God has purposed and that he has accomplished through his son the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore those he came to save benefit from what he accomplished so come back here to Psalm 110 now and in verse 5 we see how Christ was established as that everlasting high priest but what kind of high priest is he? He is a reigning high priest. That means that he is an effectual high priest. There's nothing you find in scripture concerning the Lord Jesus Christ where by his work will in any way not be successful. I know that the popular Jesus being preached today, that's the problem. That's why it's not the Christ of Scripture. Because he's being preached as one who came and did all this work and laid down his life and now ascended up into heaven again, having finished the work. And yet nothing is finished because it takes man now believing in order for God to then 
put that work to their account. That's not the order that we find in Scripture. The order we find in Scripture is that salvation has come through the Lord Jesus Christ. He earned and established it. And there at the cross, when he cried, it is finished, it was finished. What part of it is finished don't you understand? And so now his work in ruling and reigning is to assure, just like he said, of all that the Father has given me, I should lose nothing. That's a strong statement. But here in verse 5, we see that ruling. Because where is he? It says, the Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. At thy right hand. That's talking about the son who is at the right hand of the father. Why is he at the right hand? That's the place of authority and honor. And so this shows, again, God the father's favor upon his son. As he said three times when Christ was on the earth, there was a voice that was heard that said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So we see this testified here. The Lord who is at thy right hand. The favor and strength of Christ by the Father. But you can see being at the right hand, it's the picture here of strength. And striking through even kings in the day of his wrath. That shows us right there that there's none that can oppose him. This whole notion that somehow Christ wants to save sinners but can't unless they let him. They've not read the scriptures. Because here clearly he rules, he reigns. And the picture is one of a battlefield. When it says strike through kings in the day of his wrath. It means that he comes forth with power from his throne, either to save or to condemn. He has that right as the high priest. We see that specifically in John chapter 17, in his high priestly prayer there in the garden before he went to the cross. Look how he prays to his father, even here. Verse 1 says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. And then verse 2, how is he glorified? In having all power and authority of his Father. He says, As thou hast given him power, that word literally means authority, and where he gives authority, there is power. Notice, over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. So he's not just ruling over his people that the Father gave him, but over all flesh. And he's the determining one to determine whether people live or die. It's in his hand. And such is his power as Lord. And certainly... We saw that already in verse 3. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power as king. Gathering together, mustering the complete number of his elect to save them out of Zion. And so therefore, he is the reigning high priest. So he rules over his people, but he rules over all nations. All power is in his hands. And that's why in verses 6 and 7, to conclude here, he's the judge of all nations. People can kind of plug their ears and go their way and say, oh, that's just something you all believe, but it doesn't concern me. Yes, it does. Because everyone will stand before this one whom God has established forever after the order of Melchizedek to either be blessed and hear him say, enter into my kingdom prepared for you before the foundation of the world or to hear him say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. That's why in verse six, it says he shall 
judge among the heathen. And that word heathen means the nations. There's no place in the world, just because a certain nation is given over to worshiping, for example, Islam, Muhammad, or go over to the Far East and they're given to worshiping Buddha and whatever other, get over into some other places and they don't, they're, they're animus. They worship any God of their, their making. It doesn't matter where they are. It's still Christ, the Lord, ruling over those nations. And uh, he came to conquer and conquered. That's why he is the judge. And it's interesting here in verse 6, it says, He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. I don't believe this is just speaking generally of his power to do this, but when you think about the context here, and you think about Christ coming to fulfill all of this in the land of Israel against much opposition, the scriptures say that he came unto his own, his own received him not. There's a particular fulfillment, I believe, in verse 6 here, historically. And that is in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Just like that Aaronic priesthood was only to be for a time and season. When was it completely wiped out and put away? Because the Jews were determined to maintain it. Well, it's when Christ came in power there in the first century in 70 AD. And his wrath, when it speaks there in verse 5, he'll strike through kings in the day of his wrath. That had a specific fulfillment with that generation that's described in Matthew 24 where Christ said, this generation shall not pass till all of these things be fulfilled. He was talking about Jerusalem being surrounded by armies and it was a day of wrath against that people and that nation that continued to reject Christ as the Son of God. If you look in Luke 21, and this is an entire message in of itself, so I won't be able to spend too much time in it, but in Luke 21, just like Matthew 24, Christ is preparing his disciples for what to expect after his ascension into glory. And I know a lot of people like to take Luke 21 and refer to some future time yet to come. No, it's fulfilled when it speaks of nation rising against nation. There'll be earthquakes. All these things took place in that first century leading up to 70 AD. And I say that because it says in verse 19, in your patience possess ye your souls. He's addressing those that he came to redeem and did redeem by his shed blood. They were his. And not to fear when men would take their bodies, take their lives, but possess your souls. What's important is soul salvation. That's what Christ, that's why he, his soul was an offering for sin. And our redemption is in this soul that he has redeemed. Yes, one day we look forward to having those glorified bodies, but here possess ye your souls. That's the part where the spirit causes a sinner to look to Christ alone. But he says in verse 20, when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst of it depart out and let them that are in the countries enter therein. It's not talking about the end of the world. There would be no time when Christ comes again. Here it's speaking specifically of Jerusalem being encompassed. Now, you'll notice there in verse 22, for these be the days of what? Vengeance. That would be wrath. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. I believe that's what we're seeing portrayed here. That Christ would come after the order of Melchizedek, but those that continued to pursue coming in another way, God's wrath would abide upon them. And it says there in verse 23, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that, that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and what? 
wrath upon what? This people. Not his people. His people, Christ bore that wrath, but upon that people, which were the Jewish nation. So I believe that's all depicted also here in Psalm 110. And just like they asked Christ, by what authority do you do what you do? It's by this authority. The Father has sworn, and it is so. And then verse 7, Psalm 110, verse 7. When it says, he shall drink of the brook in the way. This is talking about Christ in the flesh. When he said, I thirst, he came very much, ever much as a man. And uh, so speaks of his humiliations, stooping to drink of a brook who is the water of life. That's the amazing mystery that we find here. But at the same time, when it says he shall drink of the brook in the way, what was that way? That way that the Father had given him to the cross, that he would be strengthened in that way, much as an army in battle stops to drink in, uh, of the brook in the way. Our Lord, therefore, was strengthened and refreshed. And when it says there, therefore shall he lift up the head. In other words, he would be delivered up above all of his sorrows and sufferings and exalted to great joy. Therefore shall he lift up the head. That's where our head is now. He's seated in the heavenlies. And contrary to his head hanging down in defeat, no, head lifted up. He bowed his head there at the cross, but then the head was lifted up when he rose again and ascended on high. His own head, that's what it's speaking here of Christ, would be lifted up in victory on behalf of his people to the glory of his Father. And that is the Lord that we worship. There's so much more there, but I pray that the time we've spent in this will be a blessing to us, encouragement to our heart, and uh, may the Lord direct our hearts to this very one that is God's everlasting high priest. Amen.